Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I'm so excited that everyone is here. I'm sorry. I'm a former teacher, so I do a lot of clapping. Can we go give ourselves a round of applause? Uh, this is such an important day. Uh, this is an important day because we are using the collective genius, and that's exactly what is in your collective genius. And we are putting it, working on the same page, making sure that we are aligning um, that the same way we've done uh, in so many other things. Collective impact is not a new thing. One thing I noticed uh, from being in this seat, and for if you don't know who I am, I apologize. My name is Dr. Brown. I'm the chief education officer. I work uh, in the office of the mayor uh, over all of education. But what I've noticed is that there is so much work that's done with collective impact. There's not an initiative that we do in our office that doesn't invite the organizations and minds and institutions and the community partners, because uh, pretty much we cannot get this done alone. And this is an important issue, and this takes precedent, and we've been working collectively around COVID uh, since the pandemic, so this is not new. Uh, this is something that you were definitely engaged in even before I came into the seat. But today we have a bigger issue. We have a global crisis as a result of the pandemic, but still existed prior to the pandemic. We have an opportunity to come together for our children. We have an opportunity to use our collective genius to make sure that when we go into this particular year, that we are thinking of those things that we may not have thought about last year. We are not going to say things like this is a think tank for learning loss because it really doesn't talk about how resilient our children are. Because I know that when I was growing up in the 70s, uh, that I did not have to deal with a global pandemic or viruses and go on to Zoom and have education that way. So our young people are resilient beyond measure. But today we're coming together to say what is missing not necessarily as this is failure, right? We are complaining. No, that's not what we're doing here today. We're saying what is missing and how do we need to rethink our institutions to make them more prepared for the crisis that we are facing today? And I am so excited to be a leading in charge and I want you as we go throughout this to really think of your commitment to this. This is not a one-time think tank. This is something that we're gonna be doing all year to make sure that we have protocols and guidelines and recommendations because we need to help one another, uh, not in a competitive way, but we need to help one another in order to fulfill the vision of our Honorable Mayor Raj J. Baraka, that every institution, every educational institution in Newark is promising for every student. When we get to that um, particular point, then we are moving with collective impact. And I know with the collective genius, what we can possibly do uh, to help every institution in North thrive and have a much more successful year. And then sometimes we get to come back in the middle of the year and say, we've been trying this and it's not working. We need to rethink it. And that's okay too, because everybody knows that that is a process of implementation. So uh, get ready to get involved. Oh, we have a lot to uh, cover today, but obviously we can't get it all done today, and it's not meant to. This is just the first meeting of many, uh, but I want to uh, let everyone know that this is the vision of Mayor Raz J. Baraka. He said in his office and said, we need a think tank citywide to make sure that we're all thinking on the same page. And all uh, for us to really hear the vision of Honorable Mayor Raz Baraka, we're going to invite him uh, to the podium before we get started. So help me uh, celebrate the visionary behind this, Honorable Mayor Raz J. Baraka. Good morning. I just want to <clears throat> thank everybody for being here. One, uh, Dr. Brown really uh, sold herself short on this. So this is really her <laughs> doing, all of us being in here, uh, moving in this direction. And I appreciate the work that she's doing and uh, all the folks in the office there <clears throat> making this happen. Um, this is a very important uh, kind of opportunity for us. 
uh, and I say opportunity uh, because most of the time we look at this uh, as a as a deficit. We look at everything uh, as as a problem uh, as opposed to an opportunity. And it's an opportunity that COVID has given us to address the things that we probably should have been addressing a long time ago. And COVID gave us this opportunity, gave us the stage, even the resources to address some of the things that probably should have been addressed decades ago. Uh, so this is an opportunity for us. Uh, the reality is what we do in this opportunity will decide what happens to our young people uh, for the next decade going forward. If we take advantage of where we are now, uh, take advantage of our collective need to do something about what's happening right now. We all together agree that our children are in a very difficult space, that there is deep learning loss, uh, but some of us knew that there were learning loss, there was learning loss prior to COVID. Some of us knew that there was inequity prior to this situation. Some of us knew that there were difficult things prior to all this. COVID helped everybody get on the same page. Helped us understand that we needed to do something together. So when I, when I was a principal many moons ago, <laughs> there, there were there were kids that I would take, you know, that parents would come there and and, and want to bring their kid there and pull them out of other places, uh, you know, kids that were 15 in the seventh grade, mm. and a parent would say, uh, you know, I don't want my kid to stay back anymore. Uh, in a district, and everybody else, or, or, or even charter, would say, uh, this kid has to repeat this grade because of whatever requirements that exist. And I would tell the parent, bring them to Central, we'll take them. And people would look at us like we were crazy. And, you know, I had a conversation with one of the leaders of the school system at, at, at the time about one of the kids we were taking that were 15, that was 15 in the seventh grade. He said, uh, what are you doing? Why are you taking this seventh grader who's 15? They're two and three grade levels behind. I said, well, then they'll fit right in because most of the ninth graders that we get are two and three grade levels behind. Even if they come in 19 in their right age, they're still two and three grade levels behind. So he'll fit right in. As a matter of fact, that kid actually graduated from Central High School on time and went on to college, right? So that, that means that uh, this idea that because our children start in a difficult place or they start from a position that's further behind than everybody else or people have been given a head start doesn't mean that they can't catch up and doesn't even it doesn't mean not only can they catch up but they can also excel and go even further than kids who start on the same level as them we get this idea we, we say all the time our kids are resilient uh, but resiliency is something that you need uh, j as a just in case we have to use it all the time. So our kids, we have to be resilient. When people say, oh, he's resilient, resiliency comes when there's difficult moments. <laughs> that you have to be resilient because a difficult moment comes and you have to overcome that and deal with that. What happens when you have to be resilient at 8 o'clock in the morning every day? Or be resilient every day at lunchtime? Or resilient every day after school? Or resilient every day when school is over and the next day and that night. Resiliency to you, uh, you know, becomes culture and trauma. And then we pride ourselves off of the fact that we made it and never deal with the fact, uh, deal with the things that we had to endure while we were making it. And the things that we embraced and took in and we carry with us forever because we were making it. And we never address it, right? And we never address it. And then we don't address the kids who didn't make it. In fact, in fact, we marginalize them even for, even further, Minima, minimize them, uh, ridicule them for not being able to make it in a situation that most Americans couldn't make it in. As a matter of fact, that most human beings couldn't make it in, that they weren't resilient enough. Then we penalized the teachers because they couldn't get them through a situation that most students couldn't make it through. And we penalized the district because the district didn't have the wherewithal and the resources to get the kids through a situation that they had no business making it through. That's the reality of where we are. And, and we've seen this, I've seen this for a very, very long time. 
But COVID has given us an opportunity to see it collectively. At least pause for a moment and see what's going on and stop us from fighting from our fiefdoms and places where we are trying to outdo one another at the expense of our children, trying to outpace each other at the expense of our children or show whose program is better while most of our children are still failing and struggling. Whether we are on a secondary level, a high school level, or elementary level, we're, we're battling with each other and competing with each other and uh, we refuse to be collective about and collaborative about a situation that we know that individually we can't overcome. And I guess what the think tank is really about, it gives us the opportunity, as Dr. Brown says to me, uh, to get a safe space to have critical discussions. You know, we learn these critical friends thing. To have these critical discussions with one another in a safe space that's not going to be on the front page of NJ.com. <laughs> Uh, have critical discussions with each other about the programs and institutions and ideas that we have to move our kids to a place where we need them to be uh, and not point fingers at one another and blame each other for the failure of a larger system that our kids couldn't make it through. Because we blame each other when none of us created this situation, though some of us benefit from it. How do we collectively come together and figure out what we need to do, what's working, what's not working, what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing, where are the gaps and how we fill them, what resources do we have to uplift these young people and to do it in a way where you might not get the credit. Oh, there's the problem. <laughs> where, no, where your name might not be in the byline. Right? And and to do it where all of us are involved in it so that our kids can benefit from it. And I think that this time is more important than any uh, because we're fooling ourselves if we think that our kids were not affected by COVID-19 and we say that they got through this and they did a good job. But I, I, I know for a fact that they're dealing with some things that they have not spoken about. That they're making it through some situations that they're forced to make it through. That they were in the seventh grade and they came back to school as a freshman. Mm -hmm. And they missed, leaped over whole years of socialization and institutional information and knowledge and all of these things that helped them. They missed a whole bunch of basketball games and after school programs and the good teacher in the eighth grade that helped people make it in the ninth grade. They missed that teacher and Miss those conversations in the hallway. You know all the things that helped you become a ninth grader and a tenth grader, that helped you become, uh, you know, uh, confident about who you are and what you wanted to do. They missed a whole bunch of those things. And they might have come from a home that didn't have the support that was necessary for them to have to keep them moving on. So they had to depend on their own inner voice and no other voices. And if their inner voice that they had wasn't strong enough, then they have problems that they didn't know how to endure themselves. And so you see youth violence going up all around the, all around the country. Youth suicide, and, uh, you know, drug addiction, and, 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 and all of those things that come along with it. So I, I don't mean to, to be up here uh, giving you a speech, but, you know, I, I feel like this moment is incredibly important and we won't get it back. And I know Dr. Brown is going take us to a, take us to a place where we need to be. Uh, and a lot of us are going to get busy. In meeting number three, we're going to have so many important things to do that we forget about doing this as a collective. Uh, and, I, I, you know, sometimes we feel like we have to get it all out now while as many people here as we can, as, as, as going to be here. Right. But we want people to hang in there all the way to the end till we create something. And it's OK if people say what you're doing is not working. That's OK. I, I don't have a problem with people saying what, what we're doing is not working. That you need to do this and you need to do that. I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a monopoly on great ideas. Uh, and as a matter of fact, as a matter of a fact, risk taking is about doing things that are not right all of the time, that might not work, that might not be perfect, uh, so that we can get to the, what perfection looks like. If you, if you are afraid to lose, you'll never win. If you're afraid to get it wrong, you'll never get it right. And if you don't know if it's wrong, 
you'll be doing the wrong thing for a long time until somebody has the courage to tell you that that's not working. And then we need to come collectively and not benefit from each other's failure, but build on each other's failure so that we can get to a place where all of us will never be unless we do it together. I hope that made sense uh, 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 to, to y'all today. So I appreciate you coming out and being a part of this discussion. I want to thank Dr. Brown again and the folks in our office for making this a reality for us. We're having an equity conference uh, coming up shortly and prayerfully all of you will be involved in that. Uh, and, and this is a, a, another step to us laying out what's wrong with education in New Jersey from the lens of Newark. Because we're going to be talking about the state, but we're going to be doing it from our lens, from our point of view, from our viewpoint. Because there's deep inequity in education in the state of New Jersey. There's deep inequity. There's deep segregation by race and class in New Jersey. 50 years or more past Brown versus Board of Education, New Jersey is deeply segregated by race. Essex County is probably the most segregated county in the state by race and class. There's school districts where the average income of a family is over $100,000 in Essex County and the average income in Newark schools is about $34,000 for families of three and four. Of schools that are predominantly black or brown, some are predominantly black and brown with a little brown. Some are predominantly brown with a little black. Newark is segregated. Even inside of Newark, it's segregated. And these are the discussions we have to have. The schools are segregated in our city. They're segregated in the state. They're segregated by race and by class. In Newark. In Newark. And the outcomes and the trajectory and the conclusions of what happened to kids in our city are often predictable based on the neighborhoods that they live in and the schools that they attend because they are segregated. It's just a fact. And we're going to talk about that at our equity conference and why do some boys end up at the bottom of all of the list in Newark and some end up at all of the top of the list in Newark. We, we, we're going to talk about that. It's going to ruffle some feathers, hurt a couple of people's feelings, and everybody's not going to leave happy. Hopefully a couple of days later they come back okay. But uh, I think it's, it's time for us to have these discussions. The books we read, the schedules that are created for our children are all wrong. They're all wrong. All of it is, is, is wrong. It's, all of our kids can't make it in the schools that are created in the way that we've created them. We have to have the courage to create something different. That's what this is about. If we can't do that, then our kids will forever be in this situation. Forever be in this situation. Because the people who are in other places don't have the will to fix it. We do. We just have to have the will to do it together. That's what we're missing. We're missing the will to do it together. I can talk to each individual you, uh, of you and you have the will to fix it alone, but we don't have the will to do it collectively. And that's our problem in Newark. Because one of us knows more than the other. As opposed, you know, our collective IQ is always higher than our individual IQ. And so it's important for us to be together. In that so, and I hope you join us in the equity conference. I hope I didn't scare you away and make you want to run uh, uh, away from that. Uh, or the thousands of young people who uh, are our opportunity youth who are not in our schools at all. We're going to be talking about them too. The thousands of them that are not in our schools at all who are trying to figure it out. Right. So, thank you. Appreciate it. I don't know how long uh, you, you want me to, to hang out, but I'll be here. So I appreciate everybody for coming out. Uh, 
thank you so much, uh, Honorable Mayor Raj J. Baraka. It's always inspiring uh, to kind of hear uh, that kind of talk because we all need to be inspired as well. Amen? Yeah. Amen? I'm sorry. I'm a, I'm a Baptist, so I, I can't be another person up here. I am going to be myself, but it's not a call for everybody to be like me. But it is something I want people to understand that this is, even though the structure may make you feel as if it's, it's the stage and it's the audience, this is a think tank. So I want us to be interactive and getting used to uh, our really our participating. So let's give our, our mayor a round of applause uh, for his foresight, his fearlessness, uh, and making sure that uh, we address some of the things that need to be done. But before we move forward, I just uh, want to give a respect uh, to the president of this house. Um, and we're going to ask uh, the president, um, Boachi, if he wants to come up here and just welcome us. And we, can we give him a round of applause for allowing this to be a place where we talk about it? And I also want to congratulate him on his recent appointment. And so we're so excited uh, to be in your house. Let's give him another round of applause. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of our Board of Trustees, our administrators who are all here, our faculty, staff, and students, and alumni and the college community, I want to welcome each one of you to this special event. Uh, as Mayor was uh, talking about a few things, I was touched, and I'm still reflecting on it, that this is not one person's job. It's all of us. So uh, the call is let's all open up and do the piece we are comfortable and able to do. And we can change. Each student, each person, each household, each small community, each uh, ward, each town, and each county, and each state, because we can do that. At Essex County College, I'm glad to share with you that we have uh, taken this up in a quiet way, helping a number of students from the lower levels, especially as soon as they jump from middle school to the high school. We have pre-college programs, and it will surprise you to hear that Essex County College is the leading college in the state when it comes to dual enrollment. Let's give it to Essex County College. Our staff are doing very well when it comes to the dual enrollment. Last year alone, we helped about 366 students. And this year, this June, out of the 95 students who graduated with dual degrees, high school, high school diploma, as well as associate degree, out of the 95, 75 of them are from Newark Township. Let's clap for our students, they did very well. So these are kind of things Amaya is talking about, that in a way we can open up and support the students right from the lower level, we are doing things differently. The reason is that and when we do the dual enrollment, it's not about SAT, where we say somebody is, has had this high um, score and that person will have to go to this university or that. If you look at the percentage, most of our students in this program are minority, the low income students, but they have the potentials. And that's why we need to work with them from that stage. We have summer programs, and we are willing at Essex County College here to collaborate with all the members here. We have uh, our dear uh, Chancellor here, Chancellor uh, Counter, and uh, other leaders also from the other institution, NGIT, and also the district. We are ready to work with everybody to move this agenda forward. So Mayor and everybody, you're welcome to Essex County College, and please open up and let's contribute and also commit to whatever we discuss here. Thank you, and God bless you.
Thank you uh, so much, uh, um, President Bawachi, and thank you uh, for the great work that you are doing. Before we move on, I want us to kind of get a gauge of who's in the room. We're talking about creating a safe space. Uh, so let's just take the time to, if you can just stand up and kind of announce uh, who you are and what institution, and then we're going to jump in and get started. I want to apologize. We tried to have the uh, table mics, but obviously the mics, you see where they are. So if you're introducing yourself, if you can just stand and project, that would be wonderful, and we'll try to bring the mic to you as much as possible. We just want to see who's here. Uh, so uh, we thank you, uh, President, for starting, and then we can just introduce ourselves. Good morning, Sharon Butterfield from Rutgers Newark. Nancy Cantor from Rutgers Newark. Hi, everyone. Sharon Ryder from Rutgers Newark for the Good morning, Nalia Aaron from the Office of Violence Prevention and Trauma Recovery. Good morning, Michelle Doctor with the North Board of Education. I'm an educator in the high school field. Chris Cannon, also a teacher in Newark Vocational, also representing Alliance for Public Schools. Good morning, everybody. Karen Gaylord, Executive Director for the Newark Workforce Development Board. Good morning, everyone. Patrice McKee, representing the Newark Workforce Development Board. Good morning, everyone. My name is Robin Hintz. I am the Executive Director of the Newark City of Learning Collaborative and Assistant Professor of Professional Practice at Rutgers University, Newark. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Ron Chow, we signed the Executive Director of the Newark Trust for Education. Good morning, everyone. Chief Kirkman, Dean of Student Affairs, Essex County College. Good morning, Lee Bello, Associate, Associate Dean of Student Affairs, Essex County College. Good morning, everybody. Uh, John Ronfeld, Executive Director of Institutional Effectiveness at Essex County College. Good morning, everyone. Samantha Brannigan, Assistant Director of Institutional Effectiveness at Essex County College. Good morning, Jim Park, uh, Director of Institutional Research at Essex County College. Good morning, Chanel Dobbs, representing Roots and Bridges LLC. Good morning, Karen H. Tumor, United Way Greater Newark, Adjunct Professor at Essex County College. Good morning, everyone. Justin Artinet, uh, Senior Manager, North Thrive, United Way of Greater Newark. Good morning, everyone. My name is Marquise Guzman. I'm the Associate Director of Neighborhood Partnerships at the Joseph C. Cornwall Center at Rutgers University. Greetings, everyone. I'm Natalie Guy from Phillips Academy Charter School. Good morning. Yasmin Sampson, also from Phillips Academy Charter School, principal. Good morning, everybody. I'm Tariq White, leader from Life Academy, here with two of my amazing students, Kayla and Leslie. Right. Good morning, I'm Mel Watson, Office of Houston College Affairs, City of North. Good morning, everyone. My name is Elvie Beer. I'm Dean of Community Continuing Ed and Workforce Development here at Essex County College. Good morning, Carolyn Gerhardt, your Board of Education. Good morning, uh, Paul Parada, Principal of Robert Street Academy. Good morning, Venetia Richardson from Exit Local Response, also at UHC. Good morning, my name is Iris, and I'm Gene Iris. I'm the social media manager for the alumni of my school at my former high school, Lee Charter School. Good morning, my name is Kyrie. Uh, I'm a graduate from MBK North. Good morning, my name is Marquise Wright, MBK North. Uh, good morning everyone, Mark Gomez-Sanias, Executive Director of My Brothers Keeper North, an initiative of the North Opportunity Youth Network. Maybe Bridge Road, Chair, Division of Social Sciences, Essex County College. I'm Charity Anderson uh, from the Cornwall Center at Rutgers Hi, I'm Gabrielle Thomas. I am a coffee advisor for Mayor Washington. Hi, good morning. My name is Olivia Kearney. I'm a part of the Office of Comprehensive Community Education with the City of New York. I'm going to get this one. I'm just entering. 
take up our time to sell um, what we're deciding we're going to do to sell? Uh, decide every city piece of life. Okay. And I see some people come in. Uh, can we applaud our students that are in the house? That just gets me excited. So I want to tell you, to, uh, I just want to thank everybody again for coming here, and I want to understand that uh, even though that uh, you might be a student, and I know some parents was also invited, and we're just waiting for people to come, uh, this is an opportunity to be honest. Uh, this is a safe place. Uh, we want to make sure that we are looking at data. We are talking about some real issues. Uh, we're talking about having a real critical conversation. And so I really want to make sure uh, that we're taking deep notes. I want to thank the policy advisors that are sitting there because they're going to be taking copious notes. Because just like you guys did it with the future of our city, where you came together and talked about COVID protocols, right? And every one citywide was on the same page and North, we're going to be doing the same thing with these recommendations on all the different levels. And so we're going to have uh, uh, a real critical conversation. Before we start the conversation, we're going to jump right into our first discussion, uh, which today uh, we're going to be talking a lot about what went wrong last year right, uh, and what went correctly, right? It's, it's always space uh, to talk about best practices. But before we move into that, I just want to do some quick norming. Uh, the first thing I just want to say that we don't disagree with people, we disagree with ideas, right? Uh, this is not a town hall, right? A town hall is a little different. You come there and you get to, you know, fired up, riled up a little bit, right? This is a think tank where we're taking our, elect, our intellectual genius and we're coming up with solutions. We're honestly talking about, in a safe space, what went well, and honestly talking about one another. Again, like the mayor said, not so it can end up on NJ.com, but so we can have a better year collectively all across the North. One thing we understand that while we might be polarized and divisive, our uh, mayor takes the brunt of all of it. Right, so when some school goes wrong or something goes wrong and north, it's all one city, right? And we need to start looking at that, that we are not in competition with one another, but we're all one north. So I want us to um, make sure uh, we are honest, uh, we're not uh, pitting people against each other. And then there's some norming around vocabulary and understanding that we're all gonna come to agreement on uh, so we can move forward and be on the same page. Uh, before we move on, I just want to talk about what is learning acceleration. I'm sorry, I have some people online as well, so we're just going to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. We have some educators. I don't know if they're able. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm Regina Carter. I work for the Newark Board of Ed um, in the Office of Special Education. I'm a learning consultant on the child study team. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. Good morning, Dr. Brown. My name is Sonia Fergus. I'm a high school special education teacher. Thank you for coming. I'm not sure if the others are able to say anything, but when they have an opportunity, uh, we will do that. But I just want to understand the hybrid is always an option, right? So understand that we can all make these meetings. Um, okay, so we're going to move forward. Uh, we're going to go quickly, um, if the PowerPoint will allow me. Okay. We're going to be talking about learning acceleration. Uh, so let's have a conversation on what we think learning acceleration is and what learning acceleration is not. And we have, uh, this is really important because this is an issue that's probably happening in our entire schools, a very critical issue. So let's just have a conversation of what we think learning acceleration is uh, and what we think is not. Anybody want to lead us in that discussion? Well, let me start off with something different. What do we think learning loss is, right? Like we think from a deficit uh, perspective. Somebody tell me, and it's not an exam, right? We can't, we're not failing. <laughs> we, we, we are all 
generating a common definition and understanding because you don't want to say, hey, I'm in a think tank for learning acceleration and we're all on different pages. So I have mom. Um, so I mean, I'll kind of do quick on both from my perspective. Since you're close to the mic, you want to So from my perspective, when I've been reading a lot of the articles, there are actually multiple definitions of learning loss. Um, so I think we just have to acknowledge that. Uh, sometimes they're comparing uh, two different groups from different socioeconomic groups that are taking classes in different places at the same time. Sometimes they're comparing groups of the same, Latino kids, black kids, white kids, but at different times in history. And at times they're comparing a kid's learning at one point in time against the kid's learning at another point in time. So those are three definitions I think that all got mangled up into learning loss. Uh, but from learning acceleration, to me the notion is, have we created the conditions that support young people in taking advantage of the learning opportunities that happen at home and community and at school? That's, uh, that has to be set first. Are those conditions understood? Uh, are, are there the right materials, the right resources, the right support? And then thinking about what are the leverage skills and strategies that cut across uh, all topics, all content areas that allow kids to access information, process information, analyze information, and ultimately use information in productive and effective ways. And if we could get those core skills really highly developed, then we provide students with multiple opportunities to practice. And ideally, in acceleration, those opportunities are aligned, so they're reinforced. So what's happening in the community, what's happening in school classrooms, what's happening at home, all speak to each other, so kids are constantly getting that positive support for growth and learning. Okay, that, that's a good answer. Let's break that down a little bit. And I start with one piece of that. The first thing we're talking about in learning laws that I thought Brian was eloquent that what you're talking about, have we created the conditions? What is it that needs to happen in our institutions that create the environment for learning acceleration? So I want us to talk about that because we're going to collectively even talk about what are the conditions that we think are necessary to foster learning acceleration. All right. And then I want to talk about one more other thing you said, conditions, but you also talk about how are we leveraging support? Okay, how are we leveraging support? Let's take notes. We're all going to be writing this down because we're going to be forming a document. But again, have we created the conditions and are we leveraging support? And the last thing that you said in your piece, and I apologize for summarizing it, but I just want to make sure we're all hearing it. Is everything in the community aligned, right, with those support and those conditions? So the beautiful thing is that if we collectively work on what the conditions should be, right, and that then we also uh, talk about what supports could be provided community-wide, not just supports from the schools. And then the last thing, how is everything in the community aligned? Can we get some young people to talk about what they hear learning loss, what are they thinking and what are they hearing? Come on. Yes. You come to the mic. Come on. You can... Good morning, my name's Kayla. Um, I'm part of Leaders for Life Academy, and at least for me, I can, I can say that in our school, we see the support from the, system, um, from the, the staff. Mr. White here, he, he really shows a lot of support to the students, and you can really tell that they want you to succeed. Okay, can we hear, can Mr. Light is a teacher? Yeah, I'm talking to you, Michaela. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mr. White is the principal, the, the founder of uh, Leaders for Life Academy. Oh, Mr. White, I'm sorry. I, I thought you said light, yeah, I apologize. I know Mr. White, okay. And so I just wanna help with some of that support. What does that look like, right? Because sometimes we don't know the best practices that's happening over here. So what are some supports? And you can speak for yourself, Mr. White, if you want to. Well, basically for us, it's meeting them where they're at, you know. Mm -hmm. Most of our students come to us with a, a myriad of bar barriers that prevent them from even coming to school. 
So being able to work with the Office of the Mayor, working with UCC, working with IYO to provide some of those resources that some of the, that some of the students may need. So basically for us, it's meeting where they're at and then chipping away at removing some of those barriers that prevent them from coming to school. Because just because they're at an alternative school, some of these young people are very, very bright. They just have barriers that prevent them from coming to school. All right, that's only part of it. Thank you for that. I just want to repeat some of the stuff, and then Aaliyah. I just had an idea about uh, learning loss. Um, when you say learning loss, I just think about the pressure with the kids coming back to school after COVID. Um, it just makes them kind of just take a step back and not want to be into school and not, you know, do their work because they feel pressured. So creating a safe environment within the class or creating a safe environment within a school, uh, for an example, giving the, the students a room where they can go and just kind of decompress because they feel pressure, whether it's exams every week, whether it's studying, whether it's just, you know, not being able to go home and be comfortable with the things that they lack and the disadvantages that they go through every day. So we have to create safe spaces in our school for our kids to feel, you know, I can come to school, but I have to work, I have to study, and I'm pressured, but also I have a space where I can go to a quiet room and I can read or I can talk to someone and I can vent. And that's a way to say, okay, now I can take a step back outside of the class and I can go back and work because I feel, you know, less pressure than I felt when I first walked in. So just creating a space or a classroom or an environment within our schools to make our students feel comfortable. So there won't be a learning loss, they'll be engaged and they won't be disconnected from their work or what they have to do every day because they're there all day. I mean, we're in school eight hours. So it's a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. So that's just one of the ideas that I had. I like when you um, bring up the idea of pressure. Like, first of all, when we come and a kid comes to class and says, we five years behind, we already creating that pressure, right? Right, because kids automatically start the year, you even need to teach a lesson and they feel overwhelmed, right? Yes. So Dr. Brown, I think that's really interesting, right? Because education ultimately is a contract between the education system and the kids and families, right? And that contract says, we're going to provide you with all of these uh, learning opportunities, these resources, these supports, and because you have access to all of that, we believe you're going to learn these things, and then we're gonna assess you to see if you learn those things. And what's been interesting, I think uh, the mayor said this before, but COVID brought it to light, that contract wasn't able to be Okay. executed, mm -hmm. right? Um, we, we weren't providing kids with the optimal set of learning experiences. We weren't giving them the resources for many reasons, but those weren't there. And it's interesting to me that now we're assessing them on what they were supposed to have learned but didn't have the opportunity to learn, and we know the outcome of that, right? right? So we're creating pressure on the, the kid when truthfully the issue should be we maybe need to be rethinking what assessments we're giving them. We may think about, rather than uh, understanding what they didn't learn, understanding what they did learn, uh, right? How do you build, a, how do you change a system that is so entrenched in a way of working when that system just underwent the biggest disruption to it that we could possibly imagine? Exactly, and we, and maybe it was just me, raise your hand if you just thought it was too much testing last year. Is it just me? The kids, that's what I want to see, the young people, yes. Uh, you, you didn't introduce yourself. Come on. He's representing Donald Payne. Come on. Just introduce yourself. Okay. I want to hear from the young people, yes, talk to me. Um, I think learning loss to me is that yeah, the school systems, but it's also a child's environment because their environment plays a big part of their school learning. Because growing up in Newark, and a lot of people don't think Newark is a safe space. A safe space. Um, all the killings, all the shootings, robberies that happen in Newark, that plays a part in a child's life because if you grow up in a bad area and you gotta go through that area just to get to school, that plays a part. Like. You don't want to get up and go outside knowing that, oh, something could happen. And also, learning loss to me is that um, different levels of learning. Um, one child can maybe at a 12th grade level, while another child at like a 9th grade level. 
And I, I feel as though that's a gap in this learning system because, um, oh, Doing great so far. We, we should be able to close that gap because the same level that that student should, the same level of education that students should get should be equal with the rest of the students. No, no student should be left out or feel like feel as though they are left out because they're, they are unable to learn this curriculum rather than, oh, I can't do it, or I just give up. I feel as though students should be able to learn at their, at their place and at their level rather than have to play catch up with other students. I'll go with that. Yeah. Um, learning loss to me, uh, y'all can hear me? Did you? Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, I introduced myself. My name Harris, not G. Oh, Harris. Okay, From Elite Charter School. Yeah, right. Learning loss to me, I, I just don't agree with the term, like, because you, if you learn it, you always want to know it's going to be in your mind. So we all learn it right now. So it's like, so I just think that um, learning loss is not like a good term to use because we all learn it. Um, I'm going to add on to that. Um, yeah, I agree with everybody else said about making a safe space. That's true, but uh, make the safe space feel normal. Like, don't categorize it. Make 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 everything normal. Um, and don't don't pressure yourselves too. It's, it's just just um, use the students as uh, like just learn from the students. Just bounce off the students. Just make it easier for yourself. Like, whatever the students is going, like like capitalize off. Of, like, I can't like I can't. I'm trying to find a way to say it. Like, don't take it too personal. Type. You know, just make it easier for yourself. Like this, uh, um, trying to make it, let me see. Just saying it. You know what I'm saying, right? Because it's a whole different generation, so it's hard for y'all to like, but it's just, just go with the, uh, y'all get it. <laughs> Wait, say, his, say your name again. Najee said we cannot use the word learn and loss anymore. We all agree that we will not use learn and loss. Yes, yes, excellent. That's right. Dr. Brown, can I, I'm going to just like um, kind of direct us in a way so we can, I don't want us to beat around the bush and we do that a lot. You know, we don't get to it because we try to, you know, make everybody feel comfortable. And uh, this is a time for people not to feel comfortable mm. and not pretend that we comfort comfortable in these situations because this situation is not comfortable. Uh, according to Chalkbeat and the press and all these other people and comparing people, learning loss is the time when you're not in front of a structured learning environment that you automatically forget some of the things that you learn during that structured environment. So in the summertime, you might fall behind and so you need to be reminded or uh, some things need to be reiterated to you. Everybody has that. We'll go to this meeting and after the meeting you may forget some of the things that we talked about in the meeting. That's why you took notes so you can remember those things and there's other people you may have a conversation with that remind you of what went on in the meeting that refreshes your memory to get you back to where you began. And in the summer we lose those opportunities and so in other districts, they have opportunities for kids to further their education in the summer, uh, whether they're going to a camp or some kind of college bound program, upward bound or some other thing that's helping them not only just remember the things that they learned during the school year, but even accel accelerate that. Uh, so when they get back to school that they even they haven't missed a beat. And a lot of times we don't have those enriching experiences in places like, uh, in, in, in a city like Newark, and we create those spaces in Newark now. We have many of those opportunities now, but connecting kids to those uh, places have been, has been difficult, uh, you know, in the summer. So what COVID did was actually put us out of that structured learning environment, not just for a summertime, but for two years. Mm -hmm. So kids have not been reminded about the things that they had to do for two years whole years they have not been in a structured learning environment and we hoped that they could get it through the internet but we found out that there was inequity even in broadband so many of the kids didn't even have internet service to get online or they didn't have the hardware to actually do that so the city of newark had to 
uh, the Board of Education gave out Chromebooks, which is not a computer, but it's a Chromebook. I mean, it'll, I mean, it's a computer for poor people. And, you know, we had to put uh, broadband in the rec center so parents could drop their kids off at the rec center uh, so they could engage in learning. But many of the kids didn't get to the rec center because their parents didn't bring them. They either didn't have a car or it was, you know, they just didn't feel like it was a place for their kid to be. And so while we had it, some kids went, but not enough. So the, the, the loss that they had in that time period is going to affect their ability to continue where they left off when they get to a structured learning environment in school. That's what we mean. So we have to clarify what we're talking about. That's exactly what we mean. Uh, and to pretend that that doesn't exist is wrong. There, are, there, there is something that we've lost during that time period. Uh, and what we're trying to do now is figure out how to get it back and accelerate that at the same time because you can't catch up by slowing down. What I do agree with is what the gentleman said, that we shouldn't have kids uh, penalized or, or they should be learning at their own pace. I think kids should learn at their own pace. The problem with that is that we don't have a school system that allows people to learn at their own pace. And we don't have an educational infrastructure in the state of New Jersey, probably nowhere in America, that allows kids to, to work at their own pace unless it's some kind of alternative school to work at their own pace. Well, I agree to in totality that that's what should be happening. Kids should be able to learn at their own pace, accelerate uh, based on what they're com comfortable with, and then push their comfort further based on their time, the timetable you gave them individually. But that's not how the school system is organized. Everybody is thrown in the same class, and the teacher has to figure out how to teach people on 11th grade level and kids in the 7th grade level in the same class in 40 minutes. And then we got bright enough and start saying, oh, you don't have to do it in 40 minutes. Now you can teach the same thing in 80 minutes. So kids who failed in 40 now can fail in 80. Uh, so we, we have not changed anything uh, at all. I'm sorry to, to uh, put a damper on everything that everybody was talking about. But, you know, I like to get to it. You know what I mean? I, I, I want to get to it because we're responsible. I'm responsible. I don't know about everybody else want to take responsibility, but I'm responsible. So I'm responsible for all of the stuff that people are talking about. I'm responsible for the things that you're doing and the outcomes that are not happening. I'm responsible. Even when I'm not responsible, I'm made responsible. So uh, at the end of the day, I need us to talk frankly and seriously. Even if you don't know Frank and your name ain't Frank, I need you to be Frank <laughs> uh, today uh, and seriously about uh, you know, what, what, what we're dealing with today, because this is very serious stuff. This is very, very serious stuff. Can I say something? Mary, you said um, something important about learning laws and figuring out how to get that back. I'd like the part of the conversation to be, do, do we even need it, right? right? Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that I found during the pandemic, uh, we made, me and my daughter made a decision to homeschool her children. Mm. And some of the things that we learned during homeschool there is no way ever my grandsons would ever learn those things in an institution. So when we're talking about black boys specifically, what are they actually learning in these institutions and do they need it? Right. So how do we restructure that? And I think that you bring up a good point where learning acceleration deals with those, right? Because learning loss is the problem, but learning acceleration is that environment where, uh, number one, and I want to kind of also deal with this with learning acceleration, you have to believe that people can do it, right? And I think that, that when we talk about equity, I think it's important to understand that we're in systems with barriers that don't believe young people can accelerate learning. And then to bring up with your point, um, Chanel, is what part of the curriculum do we just not need anymore? Right? I mean, when it doesn't reflect everyone, right, and everyone's background, why are we keeping someone back because they didn't read uh, four Shakespearean plays? Um, and do we really need all four Shakespearean plays, but just really acknowledging that there might be things in the curriculum we just need to rethink? And not that this is anti-Shakespeare, but I'm, when we're talking about learning loss and creating an environment of learning acceleration, what are we really willing to lose? Right? And I know that, Robin, you had a point, and then you can go next. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm Robin in, in CLC. I, I just have a series of questions that come to mind. Um, one is, 
um, what is learning? Hmm. Who is defined learning? Mm -hmm. Are we okay with those individuals' definitions? Mm -hmm. What the young men just shared with us is that they have learned. That's right. Right? Even in a negative way, knowing how to navigate through danger, there are skills that are being deployed in that that can be translated into a classroom and leveraged into figuring out things like geography, physics, things like that. Right. With an instructor who's able to, nav you know, to, to be able to, as Director White said, meet that child where he is. Right. The challenge with that is a lot of times when we say meet the child where he is, the assumption is that that's a deficit. Right. No, that's an asset, right? If you know how to navigate, if you know how to transact, there's math in that, there's communication in that, there's critical analysis, et cetera. So the question is, what is learning? Is there an opportunity for this think tank to dis define what we think learning is with the voices of the young people helping us understand what learning is. The National Urban League embarked on a national study during the midst of COVID to interview young people across the country about what they have learned during the pandemic. Hmm. The league chose not to say learning loss. They interviewed young people and they said, what have you learned? Right. There was an expanse of things that were learned, really rich data that's captured. Um, so I think that's an opportunity is one. The second is if we center the conversation in the student, I'm looking at the first, I think it's the first bullet point, mm -hmm. right? So it, the students are at the end of that, but what would it be if we developed an instructional process centered in the student mm -hmm. and then looked at what kind of practices are necessary to help that student access mastery of grade level standards? If we center it with the student, that's part of the conversation that's gone on in the social emotional learning dialogue with Linda Darling Hammond and Karen Pittman, which was you're talking about student SEL, but the conversation was about the system, not the student. If right. you center it in the personhood, the human being, then if I'm focusing on the human being, then I can pour into that human being, right? Which goes to what the young men were saying about having learning happen at the point where the young person is. That's how it's supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and historically, we know that's how people who have been severely undereducated and under-resourced, historically, 400 years ago, were brought to the point that they were able to learn, right? The asset you had was then leveraged. So those are just two things. What is learning? Who's defining it is okay? And can we center this conversation in the human beings we're talking about, who we label as students? And all of that, I think, is going to be very important as we inform and build out an equity conversation, mm -hmm. because it's really centered in the individual people you're talking about. Oh, thank you. I think you sparked a lot of conversation. We're going to go right here, and then we have two there, but I know I promised to go over there, so be ready. Okay. Thank you. I certainly want to thank our mayor for even having this discussion today. Uh, once again, I'm Al Bundy, uh, Director of Institutional Advancement here at Essex County College. But, you know, I just hope some part of this conversation, a part of this learning loss, uh, if it's the right term or not, is that we have some discussion about what's going on with gaming. Uh, the pandemic, uh, you know, a lot more people got into gaming. Uh, a lot of our uh, students, in some cases, you know, we're trying to even figure out at the higher education level how to uh, capitalize on making it a positive experience as far as trying to look at esports and those types of things to bring to uh, a place like Essex. Uh, but, you know, gaming has been very powerful. And it, 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 during this period of disruption, a lot of folks. And I talked to my niece, who's a fourth grade teacher in a place that's very much like Newark. And she said, it's almost become addicting to many of the students. And she's a fourth grade teacher. She said, the fourth graders. And parents are coming to school and talking about, well, you know, they made some money because they were in a tournament and they won four or $500. And so now they don't even, you know, try to discipline their child to spend more time in their studies. It may encourage them, in some cases, to spend more time gaming. So 
we don't want to look at all, all the negative, but how do we take what has gone on with gaming and, 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 and put it into an academic environment? Because certainly there's a lot of skills that they learn. Uh, we noticed some things on there that are not so positive, but there are many things as far as, uh, you know, the, the skill and the talent. And, of course, in some cases, people are really making a whole lot of money. So it's something that I hope we, we add to this discussion about what's going on with gaming and its impact on our students. Uh, thank you for that. Um, um, as I was sitting over there thinking, um, we, we are about learning, but I think the main topic we are not really focusing on is a child's mental health. Because during the COVID pen, well, during the COVID era, it was a lot of children stressing about the amount of work they're getting from a school. And like, a child's mental health is important as a child's educational level. Because without the right or proper mental health, your child want to be able to succeed at the level that you want as a parent. And on top of that, I feel as though schools, school systems should also take the time to focus more on the child's mental health rather than the child's educational level. pivot from that Kyrie because I think it's important. Um, my name is Mark, um, MDK, and OYN. Um, but I wanted to, to um, respond to something Chanel said about the experience that her child was having at home and outside of school. Um, and I think it's, um, if I may, turn the mirror on ourselves a little bit. Um, I was recently um, drawn back to Carter G. Woodson's The Miseducation of the Negro. And there's a, a point he makes throughout that book, which I'll paraphrase, although not by much, which is, he says, the most educated Negro amongst us is the most useless in the service of their own people. And he makes that argument because the more educated that we are, maybe it's a little apropos that we are in a university with so many educated people, including myself. I'm at the school, I have a master's in educational leadership, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But because we were so formally trained, we then come back and impose that same structure that the mayor was talking about and system on our own people, right. thinking that it, because it worked for us, that it will also work for them. And I think it is, um, it's part of why I try to keep young people around as much as possible, because they're right. much less corrupted than um, I am. Um, not that I'm corrupt, but you get, <laughs> you get the point. Um, but it also is why some of the best education, um, which is another word we probably should define, that I've seen has happened for young people in some of what we would not call educated structures by people who we would not call educated. Um, I think vividly to my son, who I once took to a school for boxing, and the, bo the boxing instructor, who's been a boxer his entire life, said, I can't take him right now, but please don't take him somewhere else. Because if you take him somewhere else, they're going to teach him wrong. And it's going to take me forever to try to correct and reverse everything he learned. And without an ounce of formal research, this man knew what was required to be able to accelerate a young man, in this case, for boxing. Mm -hmm. And I think there are many folks who maybe are not in this room, who are not what we would consider former educators, who I would be interested to hear how they um, process everything from the need for mental health to the need to accelerate learning. Um, mm -hmm. And so I would just push us to also think a little outside the box, of, of outside of just formal educators. I, I just want to... Um, jump on that for a second um, and and follow up with something Chanel was saying about, I mean, everybody, the, the, the issue is like everybody doesn't have you or your whatever, you know, your 
the folks in your, in your household is not in everybody else's household. So our job is to try to create or recreate that environment publicly, systemically. And that's, I have to think of things this way because this is my, my job to do that, right? To take what's working for people personally and scale it uh, systemically so that more people can benefit from what individuals have benefited from, you know, in a small scale. And that's what this think tank is about. How do we scale this up? so that people can benefit from it who do not have the same kind of privileges that, I know we don't want to call it that, in, in our own individual lives, like the privileges that I have, that my children may have, other people may not have that. How do I create that space uh, and make it accessible for as many kids as possible? And then we, we, we can't think of either or, like it can't be mental health or education. When we are accelerating, we have to do all of it. Mm-hmm. I know that we, it puts a lot on us, but there's a lot on us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we just have to understand that because we are living in a society that is not equitable, okay. meaning that all of us are not getting what everybody is supposed to get at the level we're supposed to get it at, means that until it becomes equitable, there are some things that we have to do in the meantime, because if we don't, what we're in essence, in essence are saying is that everybody has to suffer until equitable, equi- until everything becomes equitable. And we can't do that. I can't wait for the workers of the world to unite. I can't wait for all of these things to take place. I have to do something now. And, and, I, and I wanted to just, you know, because sometimes we get in a think tank and we start, like, making things very academic. And we should do that. But we have to also make it pragmatic. Like, what can we make happen now because the only way you catch up is by speeding up. That's what acceleration means. How do we create environments where we speed things up? And here's the thing that I think people are saying, that we can't do it in the present system. And if that's the case, what are we going to create? And that's what we have to be talking about. Instead of arguing with each other about what the system can't do or who did this or what did that, what are we going to create that will be able to do all of these things for our young people? I agree that all of our kids can't make it in uh, the system as it is organized for them with the agrarian calendar, with all the other kind of things that are going on. They're kids that just don't have the opportunity to be as successful, I should say, as other people can in that situation. And how do we create a space uh, for them to be successful? That includes all of the work that all of us are doing in our individual institutions. But we don't leave anybody out or make anybody feel that they're smaller uh, than everybody else. And the last thing I want to say is that we don't need to be saved. And I, and, and, and I want to say that because there are, there, are, uh, there are a lot of folks who come here to save us. And we, we don't need savior. We don't need saviors. Mm-hmm. We, m- people go to church for that. Uh, and the masjid. Uh, they don't need you. And so at the end of the day, what we need is help. That's right. Resources, information. We need help. We don't need saviors, right? Uh, and, and I think a lot of people have that savior mentality, and we need to throw that out the window uh, uh, because it doesn't work. Um, and it's belittling to people who have been here forever, struggling with difficult things, trying to make things happen. And here you come, beautiful and brilliant. But at the <laughs> but, but, <laughs> At the end of the day, we just try to figure out how, to, how we going to make this happen collectively. And hopefully we begin talking about what we're going to build because we have to build something. Because what we have now, I don't care how good you are, is not good enough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What we have now is just not sufficient. That's why we need Leaders for Life. Right. That's why we need MBK. That's why we need the Office of Violence Prevention. Because of what we're doing, it's not working. And we need to figure it out. That's, right. I mean, that, that's it. Uh, I just want to go in that order, Gabriel, and uh, one, two, three. So I think um, something that's important that came out of COVID was realizing that students learn differently, and that's okay that they learn differently. How do we structure the lesson so that everybody gets the material? Because there were some students who, in a traditional class that weren't performing well, that only went to virtual learning. They became top students in their classes and they were excelling with the material when they came back to school. We realized that they still understood what they were doing before. So I think that in doing that, we just need to realize that 
praise those teachers who found creative ways to get the lessons to the students. There were some teachers who took field trips where they had their computers and they were showing the kids what they were seeing at museums or at zoos and the kids were gaining the necessary information and the tools have to be created and how the lessons are taught to them and we can't forget what came out of open. We can't say, okay, now we're back in a traditional classroom setting, so we do what we've always done in the setting. We have to look at, okay, well, when we were virtual, this student actually learned better when they were able to just get the material and focus right. on their own and do it. They didn't need a lot of oversight, but this, this particular student needed to have focus objects to get through a lesson. How do we bring that back into the classroom? I think that that should be a part of the conversation. And I think you bring up a good point. Like, number one, we need to get away from it. And I hear people say this a lot. Uh, we got to hurry up and get back to normal, right? Where COVID is an opportunity to destroy what was normal in order to say, okay, what did we learn from it? And are we bold enough to never do it again? Uh, my pastor said this, I apologize for using this example, but he said <laughs> some, things, some things in the church that we were doing before COVID it gave us the, the, the fearlessness to get rid of it, get rid of some of them traditions. And then we need to revisit new traditions that are more beneficial. And I think that that is to me, even though it was said in the context of a church, it really should be the, at the core of every institution. What traditions are we willing to get rid of? Because it probably served as a barrier. And then how are we going to revisit? And I think Chanel's point, uh, to go back to take Chanel's point and Mayor Raz Baraka's point, is we might not be able to provide um, young people homeschool where we are a little more in control of the curriculum, but are we willing to relinquish some power to get teachers together to allow them to rethink the curriculum so we can accelerate the learning? Are we willing to take the structures within the structures and rethink them? So maybe you don't have to read uh, 20 specific uh, plays and stories, but you can decide which ones, and then to go back to the young man's point, which ones are relevant? <laughs> like, because we gotta acknowledge that there are biases in the curriculum and um, so I just want to bring up those points because it kind of deals with learning acceleration is are we willing to really address equity for all? Are we willing to let go some systems, right, or some traditions that are barriers at this particular point? Are we able to rethink structure so we can um, be more accessible to every student? And again, what did we learn from COVID that worked? And once some students did thrive during COVID, they weren't bullied, they, had, they didn't have to worry about threat avoidance. They were able to work independently, and they did extremely well. And then we put them back in a normal environment, took the computer away from them, right, and said, we're going to go back to what's normal, right? So just rethinking some of those things. I know that there was one to, point to make over it, To make it easier, point. can people line up if they have questions? Because well, it's going to be there hard. are two points that need, well, right here, and we're going to go to them, and I know the mayor. Just, Good afternoon again. What I think we can do differently is um, lead with love. I'm not sure if it's like the social work in me, but um, for a few months we were stationed in high schools. And to your point, Aaliyah, you mentioned like maybe if they could have a room. Yes. And we had that room, room 212. <laughs> and um, they were able to come. And the when we got there, they were identifying who were the troubled students. And when we spoke to these troubled students, you don't know what they're dealing with at home. So once we were able to talk to them, we realized like it's deeper. That it's not just they don't get the work. They're dealing with things at home. So once we broke down that barrier, their grades went up. So you can't just teach each student how you would teach. It's not a universal learning thing. You have to teach them according to who they are as an individual. You don't know what they're going through. And um, another point. I have a, a daughter who has a learning disability. So she was in special education classes. And when COVID hit, it was like, I was terrified because I didn't know how that was going to affect her um, in her studies. It didn't, thank God, but some of her, some of her peers, it did mm -hmm. drastically. And she, in turn, um, was affected because they're so focused on those students who didn't get it. Now she's just staying stagnant because she has to wait for so-and-so to finish their work in a timely manner. So I think the conversation, when we think about how to um, 
address the learning situation, we have to think about those who are in special edu education classes as well. I know there's some special educators on the and, and special education did take a hit, uh, just to be transparent, and it's okay um, um, to say that out loud, right? We're legally bound, right, to say that out loud because uh, special education, we are guided by the law, but it's okay to say that we did not, and, and we're going to get to that discussion that Mr. Uh, Mayor Barack is about to lead, what are some failures and what were some barriers? And we need to be honest about that in these spaces. And special education is one of those spaces where we have to be honest about there's some things that we just can't do again, right? And, and that's one of those things. I know there's a lot of people online. There's somebody here, and I see some people lined up. And Mr. Baraka, you can jump in um, and get started with that as soon as you want to. Yes. Okay, so um, somebody over here in this space, I, I don't recall who it was. Um, made the suggestion that we should be measuring what people know instead of what they don't know. Mm -hmm. And um, a, a case in point, pre-COVID, I remember doing uh, a series of field trips taking students to Google and Facebook where they had the opportunity to sit with uh, panels of, of uh, workers at those places and have them share, how, what was your journey? How did you land these great jobs? And they, one of the most profound questions that students asked was, what was the interview like? And in the tech space, interviews aren't what they used to be. That's right. And, and with those, with those um, software engineers and uh, tech product developers told those kids was, you know, it's nice, you should have a prepared resume. That's a good thing always to have. But when you go to that interview, they're gonna slide that across the desk, you know, out of everybody's sight. Right. And they're gonna slide in its place a problem that they want you to solve. And they're gonna say, we're sending you over to this room over here, and we're gonna give you two hours to solve this problem. And you can use all the scaffolding and uh, coding languages that you need and when you come back in two hours, we're gonna to look to see how creative you were, how elegant you were, what languages you could demonstrate, how efficient your code was, and then we're gonna offer you a job if you, can, if you can solve this problem. And that's how it is. What can you demonstrate? What can you do for us? What are you capable of doing? Are you capable of learning the things we need you to learn? And can you fit in our culture? a culture where we expect you to learn like that and demonstrate like that. That's what they wanted. And when you get higher up, the middle level of the scale, they give you a week to demonstrate you know, how you can solve a problem and bring in the manpower resources and bring the budget in on schedule and on you know, uh, you know, exactly where it needs to be, not go over budget. That's how the interviews are now. And this was two years, three years, four years ago. This is real. It's not hypothetical. This is what interviews look like in the world of work now, in the tech space. So um, we're working a lot with folks who want to be carpenters and plumbers and you know, do things with their hands. Somebody who's hiring you wants to know, can you frame something out? Can you, do you have some skills to do the electrical? Are you certified to do that? Employers want to know what you can do. They're not asking you about your gaps. They don't ask that question. So as educators, I would say, uh, just, you know, somebody who does workforce development, we need you to focus on what they can do. And I would say, as a grandparent with three special ed grandchildren, one of the places you should look is among special ed teachers because what they do all day long is find ways to adapt what's happening in a regular classroom so that the children who, are, who have special needs can demonstrate what they know. They're experts at that. So look there. If, if I may. Really, what I say, uh, doesn't offend nobody. 
Um, but I just have to be truthful in this matter too. You know, we talk about learning acceleration and learning loss, but the reality is we were having these problems before COVID. Um, and you talk about, we talk about like, you know, students not meeting expectations, but one of the biggest problems is knowledge itself. You know, we, there's a big gap in history that students are not really learning about themselves, particularly black and brown students. And when you just think about that, you know, you look at Nat Turner. We know the date he died, but why did he die? We know about Harriet Tubman. We know the date she died, but why did she die? We know about MLK. He did the civil rights, but why was there a need for a civil rights? So there's a big gap in the history or a push for history for young black men and women and Latino um, black men, and, uh, young men and women. And when you just think of that for a second, just as this generation gets older, you know, uh, there's an older generation right here before us. We have to understand that the generation, this current generation, my generation, we don't know because we're not getting taught that. And because we don't know, these are the outlashes that we're seeing with, I think we've heard during the, um, the uh, study, a lot of students talked about stu uh, school being boring. It is boring. I think one of the greatest plays, that, one of the dopest plays that I did read about Shakespeare was Othello. Othello was what? A Muslim Moor. I'm like, oh, it's not what's a Moor. Mm -hmm. See, those things, right. you begin to question those things as a young child because it's a reflection of self. And if we're talking about what do we need to do, then we need a black studies curriculum. We need a Latino studies curriculum. Let's, we can talk about Spanish heritage of how they was here before, uh, who conquered us and everything as a nation and stuff. But that history has to be taught. It can't be whitewashed. Because when we start talking about why don't the students feel an like interest, why are they not invested in their own school system, it's because they're not invested because there's no self-reflection. Mm -hmm. And I want to just talk about, you know, let's just also remember we weren't doing it before. You know, I believe the uh, New Jersey State uh, Education Department said that we have a 2,800 enrollment senior class. And out of the 2,800, 80% graduates with a high school diploma. So that 20% that does not graduate, they're the ones that's off in the streets. They're the ones that either goes to MBK, that goes to NSA, and that goes to um, uh, lead charter, which is good, but not all of them go there. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about one particular case that we had from Brick City Peace Collective. We had one student that was in the sixth grade with his sister, but was supposed to be in eighth grade. And this one student who was recently arrested is a shot caller. He's a shot caller when it comes to stolen cars and stealing cars, and he has juice when it comes to those that are even older than him. See, we sometimes don't really look at what does this individual turn out to be. And when you look at the statistics, I know NCLC is here, that they have the initiative 25% 20, 20, by 2025. And when you look at the fact that 2,200% 2,200 students will graduate with a diploma in 2019, by the, uh, the State Board of Education, 57% enrolled in college. Now, because of the pandemic, 47% enrolled in college. So out of that 47% of 2,200 students, that's 1,100 students approximately. And now their initiative was what? I believe they said that 17% had a degree. That's including associates, bachelor's, PhD. 17% of 1,100, that's a low number. I believe that's approximately 450 students. So when you look at it like that, 2,800 students enrolled their senior year, and then at the turnout, we're only leaving with 450 students that are ready, academic, that has the credentials for what Newark is developing. That's not a good rate. 25% by 25 is not a good number. And you mean it's not only do we need to accelerate, we need that acceleration a lot faster than now. And we have to just look at it in that matter of what does this one individual turn out to be? Is he going to work for McDonald's? Uh, look, it's cool at middle, you know, when you're 18 to 22, but I don't want to see nobody that's 60 years old that just dropped out and, just, and that's all you turned out to be. I think our youth are very, you know, you talk about the gaming thing, they can be so much more. Yeah. They can be so much more, and we don't want nobody's pity. Let me reiterate that too. We don't need nobody's pity because I don't think, we, we don't need no white savior complex of I need to help this person be super invested. But the reality is too, the self improvement class, the self, the knowledge of self class is the most important class 
when it comes to the investment of our young people. And it has to be more holistic approaches. So we're talking about changing the curriculum, then we need to first state, what, is that white, what does that history book look like? Because trust and belief, I'm not interested in Christopher, Christopher Columbus discovering America. I wouldn't be either. And as somebody that um, went to CN Hall, dropped out with a 1.7 GPA, then went to Rucker, uh, Essex County, Rutgers, and graduated with his master's student, as, uh, with his master's degree, we can do it. We just have to have the discipline, and we have to have something in us. So that's just a big push, because as an uh, alumni from Central, I reflect on this one thing that we did at Central that I, I always loved once I transferred to Central. <coughs> The, uh, and you know the fact that you did you wrote the poem was even dope. I am beautiful on purpose. Convocations, the principal talking to the men, assist the administration talking to the women. Those moments matter for students because they see that there's an investment of the administration. It's not so much a strategy curriculum curriculum strategy. <laughs> it's do you love me as a person or can you acknowledge me as a person? Uh, that's it. I don't want to be long winded. <laughs> no. no. I think this is important because when we talk about what is the what are the conditions, and if we're not honest about the, a young person saying these are the conditions that help me accelerate accelerate my learning. Number one, there was a knowledge of self. There was an investment by people. People saw me. I was seen. I mean, people are going through our institutions feeling invisible. And then when they disappear, we wonder why. And he's saying, hey, how do you make this young person seen? And I think that that's important, not just in the investment of people, but even in the curriculum. How are you being seen? And if we're not having these conversations, then we're not really doing equity work, right? If we're not thinking about, we're not looking at our curriculum and saying maybe 80% of my students don't are not represented in this curriculum, then we're not doing equity work. So I value what you're saying. Thank you so much for that. Ms. Doctor? Hi. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, what I wanted to add to the conversation that I think has not exactly been touched on, when we talk about a systemic way of improving education or improving community, um, considering the fact that we want our students to buy into the education, as your side said, we want them to buy in, but we also need their parents to buy in. Mm -hmm. So when we think about um, the inequity that are in the homes, right, we talk about, um, you know, in Essex County alone, there's so much inequity, you know, with um, average incomes and things like that. Also with um, importance that is placed on education through, um, through parents, right, the parent involvement. So I would like to see um, whatever we create as a system that works, um, to replace what needs to be replaced, that possibly there could be a component that addresses the, the parents. Um, the parents, their feelings of, um, I guess, ineptness when it comes to helping their children with their, um, with their work, their homework, um, just including the parents as part of what also needs to be addressed because we all went through a pandemic. So not just the children were affected, <laughs> right. you know, not just the teachers, yeah, but also yeah, the parents, yeah, you yeah. know, they're carrying a lot as well. Yeah. So that definitely, I think, needs to be a component that is addressed. Because if the parents, if the parents learn to deal with and then maybe get a different um, perspective on the importance of, of education, or not even the importance, because uh, parents think that it's important, but the um, ability for them to be successful and the ability for, their, for themselves to be successful and for their children to be um, successful. It's hard for them to speak to that and support their children if they don't have it themselves, right? So when you talk about knowing yourself, like that's something that, that's something that's just very important and I don't want it to be overlooked as we um, continue our conversation. That's excellent. And I also want to talk about what Mr. Um, Mayor Baraka talked about when we talked about the disparities in New Jersey, like the average income is $100,000, and then you have Newark with his 30. And, and I might be totally interested in my child's education, but I'm working with $30,000, right? And that's just overwhelming, right? I mean, and so I just think, how are we, um, are we fighting for living wages so we don't have parents all so overwhelmed, right, and not able to be involved in the ways that they want? I know that Mr. Kanick uh, and uh, Kalisha, 
You can go next. Hi, Chris Kanick, uh, Newark Vocational High School. I have the esteemed pleasure to work with Ms. Doctor uh, on a daily basis. Um, I guess uh, one of the things I kept hearing, I was really happy to hear from Ron um, and from the mayor about an objective idea of what learning acceleration is. Literally, uh, math definition, acceleration means an improvement in the growth rate or a decline in the growth rate because acceleration doesn't always have to be positive. And sometimes we make decisions that take us the wrong direction. Um, and that just reminds me that unfortunately, learning loss is the goal of a lot of Americans. Learning loss is the goal of institutional racism. Mm -hmm. Plain and simple. Everything tells us that. And so if we're going to fight against that, we have to look at what establishes these norms for education. In the past, all of it was about testing. Testing, 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 testing for 10 plus years, uh, ever since NCLB and before. All based on an objective measure established where? In white communities like the one that I grew up in. And so we've taken a very different approach in some locations of focusing on growth. There are new tests now. NWEA is an amazing assessment that's based on growth. It doesn't say, hey, your score is this, you are bad at math or you are bad at English. No, here's how much you improve by. Here's how you grew. That's a very different conversation. And it's one students are ready, willing, able, and excited to engage in. I had no students this past year, uh, actually that's a lie, one student this last year look at the work that was posted on the walls. I had entire classes clamoring to get up to the board to see how they improved as an individual without comparison to their peers. Mm -hmm. That makes a world of difference. And so if we start focusing on improvement in that rate of growth and less on standards that are based in whiteness and based in institutionalized racism, I think we start to make real strides in progress. But if we keep saying, okay, we want to do grade level standards, the standards are made for a different set of students to succeed with the intention of seeing them succeed and our community fail. We have to relook at what standards we're even teaching to, as Dr. Brown had said. Thank you, Ms. Kanik. Good morning. I'm Kylie Sherwin, Phil Hill, Executive Director for City Peace Collective. I stepped out and folks were introducing themselves, so I do apologize for that. Um, I just wanted to piggyback on your comment uh, about parent involvement. I think that there's this assumption that there's parents home. Right, and that parents are raising their kids. And if I just take my situation, um, for example, you know, both of my parents were incarcerated most of my entire life. I had a grandmother that rearranged her entire life just so that we wouldn't go to the system. I'm one of seven, and though I have all of these degrees, I'm the only one. Right? I didn't realize what I was or what I could become until I went to North Tech and had a principal by the name of Baruti Kafele who decided that he would be responsible for me. Mm -hmm. right? So I think that there is this, um, there's this community of folks that we have to identify that are going to be responsible for our children <laughs> because if we're looking at the data, um, I'm not supposed to be where I am and I'm not supposed to be doing what exactly I'm doing, right? It, it just wasn't supposed to turn out the way that it, that it turned out. So I think that there's this assumption that parents are home and parents are raising their kids, but it's just this grandmother that's saying, I don't want uh, my, my, my grandchildren to go to Dyfus. So, you know, though I had gone those $13 an hour and my lunch aid at the local school, we're going to figure it out. And, and it's too bare of in public housing, right? And I think that as a child, you have no, no control over what certain circumstances you're born into and what parents you're born with. So I think that we have to like start a little bit earlier, identifying some of the, the, the early indicators, right? Because again, I'm one of seven and I'm the only one that went to college, that figured it out, but I'm also the only one that went to North Tech and had that principle, right? right? So then what happens if I don't meet Baruti Kafele? Right. What happens if I don't take that test and go to North Tech, right? right? What happens? 
So I think that there has to be um, that this community that we begin to identify, and this community begins to say that we have to wrap our arms around these children. And we know who these children are, we know who they are in kindergarten, we know who they are in first grade. Like, do we know the circumstances that they are really, or that, they, that they've been born into? And I think that that is partly problem. Um, and that's why, you know, I want to make rock about this idea about, you know, guaranteed education pilot program, because just like, I, I knew the principal that went the extra mile for me, it was just like, I'm gonna get her at Keene University. She may not be able to go to Rutgers, but we're gonna figure something out with Keene, right? So I think that that is something that we have uh, to, to begin to look at. Um, and if we don't do that, if we're not, you know, focused on, or we don't have this investment um, in the home, right? Not just the child, because you can do all that you want with the child from eight to four, but if you send back into that environment, mm -hmm. those projects, right? It's just a different environment where education is just not valued. Right? It just wasn't valued in my home. And I think that we want this parent involvement, but what happens when you can't get it? Like, what are you going to do? What center do you send the family to? What, what organization does that child go to? Because the parent isn't home. You know, my father, well, he did 20 years. He didn't come home until I was an adult with friends, you know? So I think that, like, that is a different situation. I think that there are more kids that have situations like me than we think, That's right. right? So I think that there has to be this community that we begin to identify and this community that decides that they're going to be responsible for these children that we need to get to the next level. Um, and I just so, wanted to, uh, to throw that out there. That's, that was great. Great segment. So I got to, I know Ms. Brown, was going to hurt me, but Dr. Brown, I, I got to go to another meeting, and she wants me to lead this this discussion here part. So I, I'm going to open it up, and uh, I just want to like uh, really get to what we really want to get at, because I don't want us to leave these meetings when we go uh, these months and not have anything that we're trying to build something here, uh, and we're trying to institutionalize what you what you talked about, what Chanel talked about, uh, community. Uh, so it's not even about standards. Like I know you got up, we had this discussion about who creating the test and what's being tested and who's being tested. That's not really. It's really not. That's really not what it's about. It puts a lot of pressure on teachers. It also puts pressure on students. But that's that's not really what it's about. That's not why we're in here, right? So uh, at the end of the day, I know what white supremacy is, right? So I mean, uh, clear, clearly, you know. Um, we still have to compete in a society that was created. We don't have the luxury of disappearing and doing anything else. We don't have that luxury. We don't have the luxury or the privilege. Like I met a guy before, uh, you know, who I was going back and forth with during the George Floyd stuff. You know, didn't look like me, was very involved in what was going on. He, uh, you know, said, you know, this year I'm not going to, you know, just the whole corporate thing. I'm not going to work this year. I'm just going to do X, Y, and Z. And I had to tell him that that stance is privileged because anybody that can tell me that they're not going to work <laughs> is talking from a frame of mind that I have no understanding of. Right. Like, I don't know what that means. Like, what do you mean you're not going to work? I mean, and who's going to be with you doing this? I mean, not working. I mean, all of us have to work. I mean, that's what we, we believe that. We know that because how else are we going to eat? Mm -hmm. We got to provide for our families. We didn't create capitalism in this structure. It exists. We live in it. And so there are things that are demanded of us that we do and perform at that we are automatically going to be measured on regardless of what we think and feel and believe. So we have to create students that are resilient, that are able to operate in all of these spaces. Right. That we can move along in a way that we need to move them along and get them to learn what they we want to need them to learn. But they're still going to be forced to take a test unless we force these people to change it. Unless we force the state and the federal government, whoever, to change it. And people can work on that. And there's some people that need to work on that and get that done because I agree with that. But then there are some people that have to take the responsibility right. of making sure our kids don't die while they're waiting for you to get that changed, right? Uh, and you're taking a long time, so I pray that you do it quickly. Uh, but in the meantime, we got to really get these kids through uh, to, to, to do the things that you had the privilege to do. You went to school, and you went to college, and you got a degree. And our kids can't have that because of white supremacy? No. No, it's not. No. I don't, I don't buy that. So the challenges and the, 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 the barriers that we come across 
are, are many. So we're supposed to be talking about the challenges and barriers of COVID. These challenges and barriers, as Josiah said, existed prior to COVID. COVID exacerbated them, made them plain and clear, showed us the rest of the iceberg under the water, right? And so people were able to see that clearly, right? And so now we know we have to navigate around it because guess what? We just found out that not only will those people die, all of us are going to die in the process if we don't do anything about it. So our marginalization of black and brown and poor folks is really going to affect everybody. That's right. mm-hmm. We're all in trouble if we don't do anything about this. And so hopefully we create something that is about community that creates a space where kids are taught love or, 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 or taught with love. We create a space where they taught about themselves, where they can see themselves that this carries on not just in the school year, but beyond the school year, in the summertime and after school, uh, that we're able to uh, test them where they are and move forward gradually as they go, that we have spaces that can help them get stronger and better, and we measure their growth as they go, uh, that we're able to do that, and we pull all the barriers out of the way that make that happen. And if you say all of that, the barriers become the schedule, the, the, barrier, the barriers become curriculum, the, the, the barriers become even the infrastructure of the school itself. The barriers become the lack of flexibility that we give teachers and the lack of flexibility we give administrators to do the things that they need to do uh, in, in those places. The barriers become our inability to talk to one another uh, honestly and frankly about what's right and what's wrong, right, without being offended uh, by it because somebody told you what you're saying was, just didn't make any sense. And you married to your idea mm-hmm. as opposed to the outcome. Right. Uh, uh, that, that's that. That's a barrier. Some of us are so in love with our ideas because we came up with it uh, that we forget about the outcomes that we're trying to get. Right. So we're in love with that. Uh, that that that's a barrier. Right. The, the, the t- barrier is our inability to pull parents, pull parents into the discussion. Uh, as was said, to pull parents into that. We want to take kids away from their parents. Uh, and one thing I learned from Dr. Johnson at, at, at uh you know, uh, UH over there, when I first became an educator, was, was when we started doing this violent stuff, he said the problem with the way you're treating violence uh, is that you think you can take children away from the environment. It's like curing somebody of a cold and then putting them back in the environment where the cold is the germinating. Yeah. They're always going to get it uh, unless they're away from it forever. So you can't just take kids from their parents. We have to find a system that involves parents. Uh, in that discussion as well. So hopefully we create a space like that and that we give credit. We pull in Leaders for Life. We pull in MBK. We pull in all these alternative uh, schools and get them the opportunity to be school uh, along with North Public Schools, mm-hmm. right? Because all of us are afraid of losing uh, children because we're afraid of losing dollars. Uh, and so we should have to fig- we should be able to figure out a way that we don't, and, and, and Mark and I had that conversation, so figure out a way that we can keep our dollars, keep our children, we can use the dollars collectively to teach our children collectively, because it ain't about you making money and getting rich, it's about our kids learning, and if all of those resources come to Newark, we have to figure out how to use those resources collectively for Newark. Whether they're at a charter school or alternative school or Newark public school, we have to figure out every dollar that comes to Newark, how we're using it as a team. Right. And until we learn how to do that, we're always going to be fighting each other. Right. We have to figure out how to do that. To me, that's a barrier. Right. It's a barrier. The kids don't think they automatically are supposed to go to college when they leave high school the same way they think when they leave elementary school, they automatically supposed to go to high school. Mm-hmm. They should automatically believe that whether they go or not is a decision that they make with their family. But. They should assume that when they leave high school, that college is the touchdown. They should assume that, right? And th- to me, those are the barriers that, that, are, that are in my way, uh, uh, you know, and, and hopefully uh, we figure out how to create a system that goes around those barriers or get rid of those barriers or go over those barriers, uh, you know. And the, the, and the last barrier to me is us. Mm-hmm. We're the biggest most uh, consistent obstruction in the way of our children. You know, our, our ego 
uh, our, uh, you know, our lack of humility, our inability to work together, to be collaborative, to be cooperative, our undermining of each other's uh, position, authority, uh, institution, uh, our competition with each other to be the biggest, the baddest, the first, the best, the better than uh, when we all are not doing what we should be doing. Uh, that's a huge barrier. Uh, for me, in fact, it's the, the, the biggest one that we have is that barrier. And then we our comfortability with mediocrity. Mm-hmm. 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 That's, that's the biggest barrier. We're so comfortable with mediocrity. We want people to leave us alone and let us be mediocre. Mm. Mm. And not fight with each other. And then we fight, we think we have to be, we have to demonize each other because we disagree. I got a right to disagree with you. I, my mama disagree with me sometimes. I disagree with my mama, right? But if you do something to my mama, you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? But I don't, I, I don't have to agree with you. And you don't have to agree with me. I mean, we, we, that's why we debate. That's what this space is for. We have a right to disagree. I don't have to, you, you, I'm not going to label you because you disagree with me. I don't agree with you. And I'm going to tell you. I don't have a problem with telling you. So I don't have a problem with people telling me they don't agree with me because I'm sure I'm going to tell you. <laughs> so at the end of the day, that's how we have discourse. Not to leave the room and start saying craziness because somebody said something you didn't like. You got your feelings hurt because somebody stepped on a space that you thought was sacred. Right? Get involved in a discussion. Create this think tank. You know, help us alleviate some of these barriers so that we can move out our district. Our Because that's what I'm saying, the district. When I say the district, I mean all of our children. I don't care how you defined it. But district to me means every kid in the city of Newark. That's right. No matter what, where they find a place. They could be in Leaders, Leaders for Life. They could be in Great Charter School. They could be in University High School. They could be in Avon Avenue School. You know, that's the district, and these are all of our children, and every one of us should feel responsibility to do something about it. And if our ego is bigger than what we need in terms of solving this problem, then we need to move ourselves away from the situation because we're the barrier. That, that is simply what it is, right? We, we are the barrier. And I've waited too long in, in self-criticism to have this discussion. I waited too long, I allowed things to play the way, I waited too long to jump in at this space in, in, in this direct kind of way, right? So if you feel like, I don't care what you're in charge of, if you feel like you can't work with us to move this thing forward, then you have to remove yourself or we're going to remove you. No matter who you are. That's, 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 that's simply put, because we have to make this thing work. We are in a desperate, desperate situation. Desperate situation. Let, I'm going to close. So when the water pipe broke, right? The perspective that I see it from, that, every, that the people who work for me see it from, is different. And I had to have this discussion internally with my folks as well. So when, at 6 o'clock in the morning, when somebody tells me something happens, Right? When I say we need to do X, Y, and Z, it's based on my perspective, what I see. You are supposed to do your job. You see what you see, right? The pipe broke. We always do this. We can fix it. It's not a problem. This is something that's good. It happens all the time, which is true. This happens all the time, all over America, because the infrastructure is old. We have to fix it. But that's not my luxury, right? I have children in school at summer school. It's 99 degrees. <laughs> Thousands of people are about to get up in two hours to go bathe and shower and cook, and there's no water going to come out of the faucet. Uh, the, you know, so when I, when you start saying, "Oh, he wild," and you mobilizing everybody, you want people to go knock on doors and support a main break, pass out water, do this, do that, do this, do this, do that, do that, and then finally at nine o'clock you realize, "Oh, he was right." We, I'm glad we did all of this stuff, right? And that's because my perspective is different. So because you're doing your individual thing out here, I see something different. I see what Josiah sees because I get the calls in the middle of the night. I get a thing that comes on my phone when every time there's a shooting or somebody is murdered or a fire in somebody's house or a kid commits suicide or a boy steals a car or a 14 year old is shot. But I get, I get all that on the phone from nine o'clock, two o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. I gotta look at all of that at the same time. I get all of the data from the schools, all of the complaints from the, the state board of education. All of those things. So my perspective is a little different 
than your individual perspective. So when I say I took too long, I took way too long to open my mouth about what's happening, right? And so I need folks to build something other than what we have. Yes, ma'am. I was just going to say, um, for Newark Public Schools, for teaching and learning, we're deeply committed to this project, um, Dr. Brown Mayor. Um, we have been working from, at least I, I started in 2019 um, to take over that office, and I can tell you we've been working arduously. When I heard some of the comments about curriculum, I want you to know that 280 new documents of curriculum have been created since March of 2020. Those um, documents reflect our students. The books we purchase reflect our students. My only regret is that it's I'm talking about 2020 and not you know 2010 or 2000 right, or right. earlier. But we can absolutely move forward. We have some very definitive ideas about how to construct curriculum in order to create acceleration and fill in the pockets, right? Because it's not one or the other, right? It's filling in the pockets of missed skills so that children can be successful. I don't doubt that the children in Newark Public Schools and, and Newark City can be successful on whatever state uh, new assessment they come up with. Um, because there's nothing different about our children and their capacity and their potential. And so we are absolutely committed to doing this. Um, one thing I might recommend, um, if the group feels this could be um, helpful, is for some of the directors that I have the absolute um, privilege to work with to come and talk about what does the new social studies curriculum look like. The Board of Education a week from, I think, tonight, uh, or, or sorry, a week from Thursday night, we'll be approving new curriculum. There's new curriculum that focus on Latinx um, history, new curriculum that focuses on American history, um, African American history as well, um, both of uh, which will go before the board for approval um, at, in a week. Um, that's, I'm only handpicking a couple because of your comments. The math curriculum has been re-engineered so that Procedural fluency is built into it, so that whole tricky part of accelerating and also making sure that students know number facts and can use those to build bigger and better knowledge is present. Last, I could go on forever about this, um, so I want to be considerate for time. The last thing I'll say is prevention of reading difficulties is job one in the Office of Language Arts. We know we must be able to get that done. I think we're poised to do that in, in really significant ways. Um, we saw that this summer across 17 sites. Um, I can report to you that progress was made um, by students academically. And um, we learned an awful lot about how to do some work with administrators in order to do, and here's the biggest part, these 280 documents are not going to do us a whole lot of good if they're not implemented well, which means first and foremost supporting teachers and the administrators who work with them in that process. So that's our commitment to this, and um, I'll leave it at that. However we can, Dr. Brown, be of assistance to you, please let me know, um, and, and we will show up and, and do that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Chanel. Uh, thank you for that, too. I think one of the things that we also need to define is involvement versus engagement. So that was very helpful that you said that you all were doing all of these things, but, and so you involved us, right? You told us that we're doing all these things, that we have all these documents, that this is coming out of the pipe. Um, we can invite some folks to come talk to you, so you're involving us, but we were never engaged in the whole process of getting that done. So I think, uh, can, I, can I just yeah, yeah. so? That's not exactly true. I, I'm not sure what's happened in previous years, but for example, the Amistad informed curriculum in K-5, I just received the final draft that was done by external people to Newark Public Schools. So um, James Williams, for example, was one of the um, consultants who worked with us. He's worked with us for the last three years in helping us to shape that curriculum. Um, there were community groups who also helped to shape that curriculum. That's just one example. I'm not disagreeing with you no, no. in other in other aspects. Um, by all means, we can we are transparent, but we're not always ex in inclusive. Um, the work with the Amistad group, I think, has helped us to think and maybe rethink the extraordinary value 
of what, uh, in this case, Mr. Williams and some associates of his helped us to, to think about. Things we could have missed that his perspective helped us. So we are certainly open to that. It's just a mechanism, mechanism of help making that work in some way. And so maybe we can even just talk a little bit about that, about how to do that. So ladies, I, I want to interrupt you because I do want to honor people's time because I did say it was 10 to 12, so I wanted us to engage in next steps. Two things I want to say uh, is, number one, I thought that the mayor's uh, uh, closing was in passion, so I just wanted to focus on that for a second. Can we just, he doesn't have to be here to be celebrated. I want to talk about that because I think that that is what the core of this think tank is, and I thank you for uh talking about the commitment for North Board of Education, but also seeing this as a city-wide standard on how our institutions will look and how we will create uh, um, learning acceleration in order to challenge learning loss. And I think that there, uh, it's important, because I'm about to talk about next steps, is how we can get more parents in a room, how we can get more students in a room, how we can get directors, or we want this to be a think tank on all levels because we're really not going to understand the problem if we don't have all levels involved. So when I send out the invite for the next one, please feel free to forward it to people that you think need to be in a room. So let me just say that, right? That we can grow as a think tank. It's not a town hall, it's a solution oriented. The last thing I want to also say is we're going to create a document which we're all going to live by, <laughs> right? So I, just like we did the future of the city when we did the COVID protocols, right? And you walk in any North institution and you step in on mats, you got the temperature, you got this, because we all collectively got together and said these are the standards of um, for every institution. The document that we're going to author collectively is going to do that. And I think that's, I want to say that, I want to talk about some of the things that we did here today because it might have felt like it was loosey-goosey, but I do want you to understand that we define learning loss. We uh, define learning or began the discussion of defining learning acceleration. And we already started one of the things, well, what, could, what do those conditions look like in order to create learning acceleration? Normally, this will be a monthly think tank, normally. What I am suggesting is that we meet a little more in August because we're talking about our kids re-entering in September. If we can do anything soon, it will be what, can we define citywide what the conditions look like, right? And I think a lot of people talked about it, mentorship, uh, addressing barriers, right? Those things are important because that is not happening in every classroom. And creating those conditions is not something that just happens in a classroom. It has to represent leadership from the top and it has to represent all around. We can't have classrooms engaging in a culture of care and safety and vulnerability when leadership may not be representing safety and vulnerability. Right, and so we are gonna create a citywide document. I will invite you, if you're all willing, uh, to meet again, and it can be virtual, it can be in person on the 23rd, and then we can get to the monthly. But we want to offer a document because we want to agree collectively that citywide, these are the conditions of learning acceleration. Citywide, this is what we agree with learning loss. And I think that the mayor added so much important stuff to learning loss that we have kind of forgotten about, like uh, the amount of curriculum you lose from freshman year to senior year, right? The amount of curriculum you forget about uh, over the summer, right? Um, but also, uh, we talked about um, how to define the acceleration. So if we can agree, I'm gonna ask that we meet again on the 23rd because we, I want you to understand we are authoring a document that we can all, after we complete it, we can all raise our hand up, right, and say, when you go to a North institution, we agree on this, 
right? And this has nothing to do with just even the North Board of Education, but every college, every elementary school, right? Every daycare center, we all understand this. And so I will be sending an invite for the 23rd. I want to thank you so much for your time today. I hope you feel that this is a valuable experience. Uh, please keep the documents. I gave you two documents that are important. Uh, excuse me, TNTP and the NJDOE already created a guide. We are taking that, some of those standards and making it very specific. It goes back to what the mayor said, this think tank is about being very pragmatic. And when we walk away that we have very practical things that we agree on. And so we're taking the abstract, right? And we're making it very practical. So if we all agree, I'll be sending out an invite for the 23rd, we agree. And then we're going to be moving forward. The charge is invite more people to the discussion because we're going to get deep and it's okay. Uh, the mayor laid out some wonderful barriers, but I'm also going to send you a link where you can start listing some barriers that you think exist and some failures from last year. Because I just want you to show our hands, agree, last year didn't look like we wanted it to look. Maybe I just feel that way. If you feel that way, raise your hand. Last year did not look like the way you look, right? The level of violence right? The level of mental health that was not addressed when the NGADA, the first principle on the NJDOA, uh, Mark, was what? I, I mean, on the NJDOE recommendations is what? Uh, that is what we're going to be talking about on the 23rd. Powerful stuff. The school system, we were ready to open Right, we had protocols. Were we where we needed to be with social emotional learning? Where we were, um, where we wanted to be with mental health. We have to honestly talk about that, and so we'll talk about that on the twenty third. Um, please uh, make sure if you need uh, me. I gave my card out. Uh, I will be sending the email with the links. So there's some things that we can get started with the documents, um, and so there's some great work that's already been done. Uh, around a lot of these issues, and this is about citywide. So I thank you for coming, and your input was invaluable, so give yourselves a round of applause, and please <laughs> come back the next time, and we're going to finish our discussion. Remember, next, next time is really, really important, because we're doing it. And thank you to our wonderful young people. I love it. They're so profound. Bring more young people.